Welcome to PhD with Women on It, Hack the Future. My name is Beata Young and today's PhD Positivity Hack delivered will be by Rosa Ernesto Plaha. Topic, how can women on it grow a career in finance? Episode 59 starts here. Let me remind you, this is a grassroots community that focuses on women on it, an inclusive forum of women in technology, startups, and female leaders who are supported by men as well. And I bring heart to that hustle because empathy is my motto. And empathy is critical when you are growing a career in finance. Before we start to talk about this topic, let me mention a few highlights. Congratulations to Tiffany Faison for winning season three of Food Network's Tournament of Champions and Culinary Tournament of the US Most Celebrated Chefs. It's always great to see female chefs hacking the kitchen and the future. Congratulations to Neka Agudolu on becoming UK's sixth Black Female Queen's Council. Her life lesson quote is truly inspiring see the possibilities beyond any obstacles. It's great to see Danupa Mili Kantankalkul, I hope I spelled it right, perform at Coachella Valley Music and Arts Festival 2022. She's the first Thai to do so. You go, girl. The female founder behind the dating app making market history Bumble, Whitney Wolfie Hurt is indeed an inspiration. Even after being forced to leave Tinder and threatened for death and rape, she still strives and encourages women to make the first move, whether it's dating up, whether it is business. Bumble made history in the dating world for its female-focused algorithm that defies traditional gender norms and puts women in position of power. Bumble's IPO valuation reached 14 billion. In founders' own words, throughout the journey of being, building Bumble, we were told that it was impossible to create a successful woman, woman first brand and platform. That woman don't want and shouldn't speak first, that it would never work. Those objections have only fueled us. Six years and countless bumble weddings, babies, friendships, business partnerships, and meaningful relationships later, we have a diverse and fast growing community spread across six continents. We've celebrated 1.7 billion first moves made by women. As Wolfie also writes in her letter attached to the IPO, the importance of a woman making the first move is exclusive to the world of dating, romance, or love. It is a power shift, giving women confidence and control. We are committed to the major opportunity ahead of us to make dating healthier and more equitable around the world. From a total of 442 companies that went public last year, only four had female founders or CEOs. Today's Whitney is known as the youngest self-made woman in history to become a billionaire. Let's go into from IPO into how can women on it grow a career in finance? Women are underrepresented in the tech industry and not only in tech industry. Likewise, female representation declines in the finance industry. Having a reputation of being male-dominated, both fields are tough places for women to ascend to the top. In the evolving digital economy, financial institutions are entering the market. Women are paving the path in the financial technology industry, serving on boards, as well as contributing to management te teams. And we have a unique opportunity to speak to um, our guest, uh, Ms. Rosa Armesto Plaja, is the deputy, who is the deputy D director general of the Federation of European Securities Exchanges, responsible for coordinating all regulatory policy campaigns and strengthening FESA's positioning on the key issues and priorities for exchanges in Europe. 
Rosa has almost 15 years of, pro of professional experience in EU affairs for the financial sector. She was head of public and regulatory affairs of FESE, and prior to joining FESE, she spent four years as a member of the management team and head of public affairs and communications of Insurance Europe, in charge of the interest representation of the European insurance sector. She has worked in Brussels since 2007, coming from Eurostat uh, in Luxembourg. Rosa holds a master's degree in economics, major in econometrics, a bachelor's degree in statistics and a professional degree in piano. She is a Spanish national and speaks English, French and Spanish. Rosa, where in the world are you today? First of all, Beata, let me thank you very much for this introduction and uh, I'm really pleased to be on the show today. So hello to everyone uh, who's joined us uh, this evening. And I'm joining from Brussels today where we enjoy a really nice uh, spring day. That's uh, great to see that uh, Brussels is finally out of the winter gloom and doom. And we are going to bring some positivity from Brussels and talk about the career uh, that women on it can make in finance industry. So let's start from the beginning because there is a little bit of art in your world and what pushed you into this financial uh, opportunity? I must say that uh, um, in terms of my career, um, nothing was really kind of, I didn't plan a step by a step or, or you know, had a very rigorous execution planning. Uh, it was more about uh, opportunities and uh, being in probably in the right place at the right moment. But uh, first of all, um, obviously, I mean, I came into finance due to my education, uh, mainly, you know, the, my studies in economics and my, the masters I got there kind of opened me uh, the, the, the way uh, to get there. But I think the combination also with the statistics uh, and the fact of coming from Eurostat made it kind of appealing uh, for, a, for a job offer that uh, at the time uh, I found in FESE. Uh, so to be really honest, uh, when I joined FESE, I did not really have, uh, you know, much clue, I would say, on finance or whether, you know, I had developed a strong wish wanted to join that sector. Uh, but I really was very curious about the job description I was offered, about joining that team at the moment, etc. So that kind of opened me the door. And then obviously, little by little, uh, I, surely but slowly, I got into the very passionate uh, world of finance and I, 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 in which I have been up until today. So I will really say that I have developed my entire career into this field. So how did you start in Eurostat? So basically, when I uh, finished my studies, uh, and in fact, I finished them um, through an Erasmus program uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, I really wanted to continue uh, exploring uh, the fact of living abroad, working abroad if possible. At the time, I finished the studies, I came back to Spain, and I started my career professionally. Um, and I was uh, working uh, first in a company in, in Madrid, in a, a multinational uh, media agency. And in there, I was really uh, doing a data uh, analysis. So I must say that somehow all my career since the very, very beginning has been very much linked to the studies I, I achieved. And what happened is that I really, really wanted to, uh, uh, as I said, no, to go out again, to try, to try to kind of explore life abroad. So I had applied to several uh, internships in, uh, in the different uh, agencies, European bodies, but also beyond. I mean, I also, I remember OECD, et cetera. And just the European Commission, uh, well, uh, kind of uh, took my application on the Blue Book program. It's something that is still going on today. And by the way, very much uh, recommend, I take the opportunity also to, uh, to mention that here. And, um, and of course, what happened there is that due to my profiling, which I combined studies and the bachelor on statistics and then uh, the, the studies I did afterwards on economics and then the specialization in econometrics made it kind of quite obvious, I suppose, 
to be joining the statistical office of the European Union. So I enjoyed six months of internship in there. I must say I learned a lot, and not only about, I mean, the things that I was doing in the department I was with, I was just supporting them, but what I really learned and opened a lot my eyes was the functioning of the European Union. And this is what somehow kind of uh, attracted me at the time and made me continue the path of uh, EU affairs. Uh, well, it's uh, really useful to know about this Blue Book um, application uh, program, but also it's interesting to hear that you were not afraid to take on an internship. Uh, how old were you when you started uh, the internship? In fact, you are, that's a very good question, Beata, because I, 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 when I took that internship, I already had a permanent contract in that multinational in Karat. So it is true that I kind of took uh, probably, uh, 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 according to some people, uh, maybe a step backwards. I was not uh, uh, thinking that uh, myself, uh, that's why I did it. But uh, yeah, it's true that it was a bit of a, of a move. And I, if, if I recall correctly, because as I did to, uh, to um, um, university degrees, I think I probably was about twenty-seven years old, something like that. Twenty-seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was. I yeah. think it, I was twenty-seven, twenty-eight. Now I don't remember exactly, but I think it was that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, uh, it's very interesting because you were not afraid to lose this. Let's call it uh, already progressing career and move into the world of opportunity, but also unknown because uh, when you're doing an internship, I guess you're not really paid fully, right? What's the what was the perks of uh, doing internship within the Blue Book program? Yeah, well, I must say I was lucky in the sense that precisely this program uh, financially is quite, uh, I would say, um, uh, decent in the sense of allowing people at a young age to somehow even live by yourself. So I really think it's something that I was very pleased to, to learn uh, that uh, the, the income you get allows you, you know, to, to sustain by yourself. Uh, but it is true that not all the internships are like that. And, um, and in fact, I mean, uh, to me really was the door that opened really the, uh, the, the, the path to the European Union also. I think uh, even, as I say, uh, uh, currently, uh, all those people that have done this Blue Book uh, program, it's a bit of a batch of honor, if I may say it, okay? Because you need to take into account that people from today will be the 27 member states are applying to this internship. So we are talking about thousands and thousands of people, but only some are selected, obviously not all. So already making it is a success. And I was really pleased. I very much remember that day uh, when I was contacted <laughs> that I had been accepted. I was really, really happy. And even though I was also very grateful to the work I had uh, in, my, in, in my current job at the time, as I said, I had no doubts to really go for it because I really thought that was going to be something that uh, probably will help him. And if not, then uh, I will see what to do. Uh, and in fact, this is what happened, huh? because it is true that once you, you finish your internship, it's very clear that you cannot really get a job in an institution. Uh, they have quite very clear and... and, and transparent rules in this regard and um, and in fact uh, uh, we were in fa all the people that we were uh, doing the internship at the same time looking for jobs at the same you know all together so it gets a bit stressful as well but it is true that the fact of having passed through the European Commission also helps in finding a job so at that moment I will say I think we are also in a very similar moment in this, in this, in the regard of uh, job offers right now, because I really think that now the market is moving a lot. But at the time uh, that was uh, 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 that um, uh, instant in my life, it was not that difficult to find a, a job in uh, European affairs. Uh, well, uh, what about now? I mean, you've spent how many years doing the things you're doing and how was your progress within FENSE uh, happening for you? Yeah, so in fact, uh, time flies, huh? <laughs> because I was counting the other day, it was my anniversary in Brussels, uh, just this month of April, 15 years. 
um, wow. that I have been here, which is, yeah, a long way. Um, so, well, basically what happened is that I finished my internship in Luxembourg and, um, well, I just wanted to give a try to see whether I could continue, you know, in the European field, in the, you know, ex continuing, you know, building up. So I applied to several places, uh, job offers, both in Luxembourg and in Brussels. And I remember at the time, I didn't know Brussels at all. I had come, I think, one weekend just as tourism. And, um, and well, but, you know, we, we all knew in that internship that, you know, uh, there were all these European federations and all the things that are happening around here. And there were job uh, uh, offers. And, um, and the, in fact, well, FESE at that moment was looking for a junior economist, but precisely to run the statistics and economics uh, committee, sorry, economics and statistics committee is how we call it. So I really think I had the profile. I applied. Um, I had very good interviews um, with my colleagues at the time. And then they decided to, to, to take me for a year contract. So it was very clear from the start. It was a limited contract uh, because they had a project. So the person that was doing that um, had to kind of dedicate more time. They needed support. And... Um, and then basically, uh, one thing, you know, after the, after the next. And, uh, what happened is that after that year, we were both parties very happy. It happened that it was possible for me to stay. And then I stayed. And in fact, that first period brought me up to eight years with FESE. So the first uh, one, one year contract and then eight year contract. Is that correct? Well, I will say unlimited contract uh, that, uh, you know, I, I, well, I stayed with them uh, for eight years in total. Then I, you know, I reached the moment in which, um, you know, uh, I thought, OK, it might be time to change. And I think it was something, again, very useful to do, uh, the, the change of jobs, you know, again, to kind of go out of your area of comfort try, you know, to face a new way of working. And in my case, it was also a new sector within the, the financial sector. So I joined the insurance uh, area and it was a very enriching uh, experience for me because that really kind of opened me again, lots of, you know, opportunities, uh, things I learned, ways of working, but also the very real management experience at this time. So this was something very, very useful. And, um, and then, well, after a period of time, I had like kind of a second batch uh, within FESE. So uh, they, I just got a call uh, from them telling me that they had opened the position I am holding today. And uh, they wanted to know whether I was interested to, to come back. And uh, well, um, after some deliberations, uh, yeah, I decided to go back. And some of my friends were saying like, oh, you are back to first love. <laughs> so in a way, it was a bit of a joke because I, I will say it's not very common to be back into a, into a company you've been with. But OK, in my case, it worked out very well. Obviously, I have always, uh, you know, left very good uh, memories and, and relations in every, everywhere I have been. So it has worked out like that. As we say in a relationship, uh, you never go back to the same waters. Uh, you decided to do so. You always leave the door open. And uh, I wanted to ask you, um, how did you prepare for all these stages? Did you read something before the interview or was it just like, I know everything because I've been in the industry for so many years? What's the process of uh, Rosa applying for a position? Well, the way I follow, I would say, is obviously you need to prepare. And I think that uh, almost everyone will agree with that. I mean, I don't really, uh, I mean, I, I believe in uh, the prepare improvisation, so to say, right? Um, so obviously you need to think through, you need to also uh, analyze what you are looking for, what you want to offer, what you want to highlight. And, um, and in that sense, I prepare a lot, I would say, from a kind of uh, personal point of view in terms of soft skills. Obviously, um, what happens is that uh, I was, for instance, when I moved from the exchange industry to the insurance industry, was a completely, you know, new field. So even though you think, okay, it's finance, yes, it is finance, but, you know, not many things are in common. So what I had, I would say, 
uh, transportable was the fact that I have always been working on European affairs, on advocacy, and I know Brussels quite well by now. But when it comes to the content, that is something no, that I had to learn. And what I did is I played with honesty, right? I mean, saying, look, you are, I think you in this different positions I have been, um, you, I understand that they were looking more for a European affairs profile. This is what I can bring, you know, preparing certain skills and explaining but when it comes to content i really had to kind of uh, build it up uh, from from the ground so of course this requires a lot of intellectual effort and uh, requires you know moments of um, you know discomfort you know in the sense of okay not knowing not really understanding from the beginning but i really really think it helps a lot because only by experiencing things and by pushing yourself i really think is how you really grow so then when i got the opportunity to be the deputy director general of fese i felt that all the paths i had been doing up until then helped me a lot to kind of fill uh, fill the shoes there to fill the shoes and also feel confident to apply for whatever opportunity might bring. We have a couple of questions in the meantime, before I read them aloud, what is your dear audience way of preparing for interview? Share with us, tell us how do you prepare and how you are preparing yourself to hack the future. We've got a great uh, comment from IPO Beat. In Patrick's opinion, somebody we know dearly uh, on this show, Patrick uh, Young is my husband privately, but also he was the host of Rosa's uh, previous uh, uh, appearance on IPO Beat. Perfect PhD, the incredible, brilliant Rosa Ernesto Plaja, speaking with the incredible, brilliant Beata Young. Thank you so much, Patrick, for watching us. I hope you bring us challenging questions. Agata, hi, Rosa, great to see you on a PhD. How much did playing the piano to a professional standard help with your career? That's tricky. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, thanks a lot, Agatha. Uh, I must say, it helped me a lot. Uh, and uh, why? It's because all all the discipline I learned when I was younger. Um, so, obviously, when I, I mean doing these studies of music, um, I, what I got with me is um, the the pleasure of the music. You know, yeah, it's something I enjoy a lot as a hobby. Um, I am very enriched and, and fulfilled by that. But what really helped me in terms of career, uh, really, as I said, is the discipline and the fact of, you know, not listening too much to yourself when you, of course, go through difficult moments, you go through doubts, you go through distraction, even laziness that I think is in inherent to humans, right? I think that helped me to say, no, that's the way I need to do it. Just get on with it, get it done, you know, and move on. And this is something that really gets very deep in my, in my profile. And why is that? It's because I did all these studies of, uh, of uh, piano in parallel to the, my current or, or kind of ordinary studies, meaning that not only, you know, my secondary school, and uh, up until uh, getting into the university, but also the first years of university. And in fact, in there, uh, I was kind of overlapping the, the toughest years of, of piano, which are obviously always the last ones, where you really need to dedicate a lot, but in parallel with my, my studies in university. So I just need to kind of combine the two, had to do it, I will say. I mean, of course, I had uh, kind of, I was tempted sometimes, you know, <laughs> to drop it. But no, I did really decided also with the push of my parents to finish it. And in the end, you know, this discipline, um, this is what um, helped me to, to, to drive things forward. Discipline, hard work, practicing, practice makes perfect. Let's go on to a deeper uh, question from Agatha. I would like to play on it and I would like to ask, who was your inspiration in piano? Well, I must say, I probably am going to upset, disappoint with this answer. 
No, I didn't have a, any specific inspiration in terms of a musician or someone I admire in particular. It was really something that came when I was a child that, uh, in fact, my mother uh, was really, really keen that I uh, at least initiated the studies of music. And then what happens is that, you know, time passes and, uh, well, I was doing okay in these studies. I also... Well, I, I need to be honest, you know, in the conservatory, I met very good friends, you know, at a time and an age that, you know, when friends are good, you are very, very close to them. So, you know, I really had my parallel school life uh, with, this, with the conservatory. And in the end, you know, um, I reached a moment in which, you know, I was like kind of, look, uh, probably I will not, you know, dedicate my career into music. However, it will be a pity, and this is what my mother was telling me, you know, it will be a pity to stop now having done all the, you know, all the work and made all the efforts I had been doing, you know, the years before. So it was more of a kind of uh, inertia of continuing, you know, for, uh, you know, trying to achieve the, the completion of the studies rather than getting inspired or, or anything. I mean, uh, in fact, I, if I'm very honest, when I finished, I said, okay, this is now done, you know, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but then I am replicating the same with my son. <laughs> so I am inviting him to follow also uh, music lessons because I really think that brings you loads of tools. I mean, it's very logic as well in terms of the way you learn how to think and how to, you know, to, to confront things in life. Uh, practice makes perfect and also um, we are happy to hear that your son is following your steps uh, because Rosa is definitely a role model we can uh, model our life on. Uh, we have got lovely comment from Jamil. Jamil Navarosa says, good to see Rosa again. Hello from IPOV to Woman on It. Hello Jamil, lovely to see you. We've got Aspirant who sends lots of love, whatever Aspirant is <laughs> doing here. And we've got In Love and in Pain. Hi Beata and Rosa. Another interesting topic, smiley face. Do you need to be a risk taker to work in the finance world? Gracias. Smiley face. Yeah, that's also a very interesting question because indeed finance is always linked to, to risk takers, right? I mean, if we think about the, the bull and the beer, you know, you think, okay, we need to kind of have a, a maybe, you know, a, a determined profile to that. I really think there are many different ways to work in finance. So not precisely you need to be a risk taker uh, very concretely. However, it is true that uh, you need to be focused and empower yourself, I think, in, the, in this field. In the sense that there is very high competition, um, you know, things are moving really fast in terms of technology. And we can see uh, and even now with, through the pandemic, you know, things have, you know, speed up a lot in terms of what is now out in the market, how digital we have all become, uh, the banks, etc. So I really think that you kind of need to be awake. It's a sector in which, you know, you need to be awake. You need to always be reading and educating yourself on what is happening and what is coming up because otherwise you lose track of it. So broadly speaking, I would say it's more that than anything else. Obviously, if then you decide to take the, for instance, the career of trader, etc., then probably, yes, you will have to develop some sort of skills that might be uh, going uh, along the lines of, of how to take risk uh, um, and how to move around. But otherwise, I think more to, as I said, is to be, you know, uh, empowered and to really know where you want to go and, and really be very curious. I think curiosity uh, is something that I find very important in this sector. Curiosity, um, uh, focus, uh, but there are definitely some things that are frustrating as well. Some things that are you have no power over, right? How are you dealing with your frustration? What is frustrating you the most? Oh, <laughs> well, um, I really try not to be frustrated. So um, uh, this is something I am uh, practicing and I, I am uh, learning from. Uh, but well, when this feeling arrives, because of course this is again uh, one feeling, uh, you know, close to, to humans, what I really try is to uh, take a step back, try to breathe 
and uh, try to think rational. Because I also think that, you know, frustration, after all, is quite linked to emotions. Um, so I think that the trigger comes from something that you are feeling about and also about the reading you are giving to a certain uh, uh, scenario or certain event that has happened to you. So I really try consciously to, uh, well, think uh, um, calmly and try to analyze. And then there are things that you then kind of see, okay, it was not as important as, you know, I thought at the moment, or there are things that you just say, okay, I just need to accept and move on. So I really think it's about analysis and uh, I am quite, uh, you know, focused on uh, self-assessment uh, on this type of uh, situations and really try to keep as balanced as possible. So I really try not to get into frustration if possible. <laughs> So, uh, as an analytical thinker, um, you definitely got the power of not letting your emotions take over you. Uh, we have got a comment from uh, Patrick. Uh, have you had any particular role models in your career, male or female? Uh, that's indeed a, a, a great question. I really think that, uh, yes, of course, I, I did have uh, role models. And, um, and in fact, there are uh, several people that had really impacted me uh, through my career along the way. And um, I, I really feel I have been very privileged uh, to get support and to learn from a great and visionary both men and women. So um, I think that uh, when you go through life, you know, with your eyes open and you really pay attention and you kind of, you know, uh, look at what's going on, uh, you come across many inspiring situations and, and, and people. And, uh, and I really think that applies both uh, to your private, but also your, your professional environment. So I really think that, uh, you know, all these kind of uh, models that um, I have seen uh, brave, I have seen determined people, but also people that have taught me to take uh, uh, sensible risks and to really push myself are the people I very much admire. And I have been very lucky because I had a few that uh, I, I enjoy the company. Nobody uh, in particular to mention at this stage? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I wouldn't like to name and shame, so to say, but okay, <laughs> if someone does a little bit of research, well, I have been very lucky with my bosses, um, very, very lucky. Um, um, I mean, I really encounter people that really, you know, make me uh, blossom in a way. So, I mean, if, you know, in fact, I can think of the three key bosses I have had here in Brussels. And I mean, the three, you know, two women and one man have really helped me the way through. But uh, uh, yeah, probably the person that probably impacted me the most was uh, my, my first boss uh, that I had here in Brussels, the one that hired me, you know, the one kind of that opened me the door in Fese, uh, which was uh, Judith Hart. So it's the one that uh, you also know very well, Beata. And uh, yeah, I remember I was very young, you know, I was, had l loads to learn. And you know, her passion, her, you know, also fun uh, way of looking at things uh, and, and dedication. So the, the very hard work side of, of, the, of the person as well, uh, kind of really opened me and inspired me a lot, yeah. Well, David Hart, thank you so much for bringing uh, Rosa to this stage. And we are happy to follow her steps. And not only us, because we can hear that Marianne is sharing. My nephew will definitely follow your steps also. Time to enroll him in piano class, Marianne says in her comment. That's very kind, Marianne. <laughs> I hope he's going to succeed and not give up because it's quite challenging right when you putting your fingers and the tones not always come through as we were imagining i can tell that because i used to play violin and the first time i was seven years old i had to wait a year before i got that instrument into my hands and the first time i started playing not only it was out of tune but the sound was nothing like what i heard over the radio so 
that's definitely something to be admired for doing and continuing for so many years, Rosa. Well done. Right, uh, let's go into uh, Olga's comment. Great show, Beata, as always. Rosa, when you are in meetings in Brussels, how good overall is the diversity between men and women? Well, I would say that uh, probably, you know, easy to guess uh, the gender diversity, I understand that it's about that, no? the question, is not as uh, great as I would like it to be in the sense that, you know, in society we are 50% against 50% broadly speaking, uh, this is not represented like that. Um, however, I think uh, we can be positive about it because things are changing and there are more and more uh, women uh, coming in place and um, and I really think this is something that we should not forget. I mean, it's important obviously to push you know, that there are uh, more and more, uh, you know, uh, I even would say regulation, you know, in that sense. So, for instance, you know, there has been a lot debated the quotas here in the European Commission. And, for instance, the, Europe, the, the public sector uh, is applying it uh, quite uh, forcefully. Maybe the, Europe, the private sector lacks a little bit behind. But, um, but well, I think we are getting there, you know, probably better to, you know, it will be hopefully in some year's time. But I really think that anything as well that uh, any of us as female roles, we can do, you know, to empower younger professionals and to really try to inspire people, I think is very much welcome. So I also think that we need to take an active role all of us, you know, uh, uh, that we are there to as well try to help and, and, and facilitate uh, uh, for that. But well, so far we are not yet there. So in terms of diversity. Uh, and another question on built on that diversity issue. Uh, we've heard the word diversity, um, but I would like to talk about diversity of thought. Uh, have you had any issues with explaining something that, uh, you know, was uh, quite obvious to you, but uh, everybody else in the room thought quite the opposite? Well, uh, I will say that, uh, no, I have not uh, encountered that situation um, in the sense that, well, well, I think that if I, I try to explain something and, and, you know, no one was picking uh, up, I really think that probably it's because I was not really explaining myself, right? I don't think it has to do with the diversity of, uh, of ways of thinking or approaching. It is true that um, sometimes being a, a, a woman, you need to push yourself more than a man. That is, uh, this is something that I have seen and I have experienced. But this is why it is very important that we do not doubt about ourselves. And when you really think you have something to say, you just try to make a space and say it. So I really think we need to also practice that. And, and in fact, I really think that, for instance, in terms of um, uh, skills, right, that, you know, that uh, people should have, you know, to drive their careers, I really think that most of the skills, I consider them uh, gender neutral, right, in terms of, for instance, communication skills, ethics, leadership. But it is true that there are two skills that I think are a little bit more female in a way, which one is uh, assertiveness, you know, the quality of being self-assured and confident without being aggressive. Um, and the other one will be the empathy. I do think that this is something that is now being put in value more and more. And I also think that this is something that comes a little bit more natural in, uh, in, uh, in women than in men. But as I say, I'll talk obviously very generally here. Huh? You can always find a, a good, uh, you know, a qualities in these aspects uh, that are, you know, combined in a, in a, in a men uh, profile. Um, so it's not that, you know, I'm not talking about uh, any concrete person that I have in mind. It's more, you know, in general. But I really think that, yeah, that's, um, that's how I, I will see that, uh, that, uh, that situation. I cannot hear you, Beata, now. 
yes, that's true because I muted myself. Uh, apologies for that. All right, uh, back in control room, I would like to say that I'm delighted to hear that finance industry is welcoming women and there is a more opportunities for us waiting for us um, i wanted to ask you about um, your career now and what is any if any exciting project that you're working at the moment yeah so yes i am um, and i think this is something i discussed at length uh, with patrick uh, a few months ago uh, we are now currently going through the MIFIR review. Uh, this is a very important and uh, masterpiece of legislation for my sector, for the exchange sector. And um, currently uh, we are in the middle of the negotiations uh, from both co-legislators. So not only the European Council, but also uh, the parliament and um, and what we are doing of course is now trying really to understand the different positions of the member states trying also to well we are in fact awaiting for the draft report report from the uh, rapporteur in the econ committee but in the in the course of this happening we are also you know pulling together our members to form positions to adapt our positions depending on what's been discussed because you know everything comes from the proposal that we got from the european commission but things are very dynamic so we are really you know trying to move fast um in trying to fit that uh, and not only this because as we are now in the second half of this commission's mandate and obviously they really have a big ambition to get done many things before they go into elections in 2024, there are other things going on. So, for instance, it's quite active the listing side as well of my sector, the retail side as well. There will be a, a proposal uh, in a few months to come. So we are really busy with that. But OK, what takes my time uh, really, uh, I would say more kind of broadly, is uh, is this Mayfield review, consolidated tape and all the things that, you know, we discussed with Patrick uh, uh, back in December. Right. It's quite a lot to manage uh, various projects. And so my question is, how do you keep yourself focused? Well, uh, for that, I think the, the answer is quite uh, direct and it's just uh, that I very much enjoy a fantastic team. So uh, I think obviously without the team, uh, we couldn't really uh, get uh, things done as we do. Uh, and then what I really try to do um, as a manager is I really try to push people. I mean, once I see that they are, uh, you know, uh, solid enough or, or kind of ready enough to, to do things by themselves, I really try to push them to take responsibility and to take uh, calculated risks because I really think that this is really the way to, to grow by experiencing you know you really need to sometimes be faced on certain things to then be able to to drive and in fact this is something that i am very grateful uh, to the bosses i have had up until now they really uh, operated like that with me and this is also what really helped me you know to push myself and and to be able to learn and 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 to and to get things as you wrote to me uh, during my career, I have benefited from many mentors and I felt particularly inspired and encouraged by the people who taught me to take sensible risks and tackle problems and not to shy away from pursuing good ideas just because you might encounter obstacles along the way. Truly inspiring, uh, Rosa. We have got comments from Patrick, UG, Judith Hart. When is she coming to uh, our PhD? Well, I hope uh, you're going to pass on some contact details. I would be happy to invite uh, another role model to our show. Patrick also says, fair point on assertiveness and particularly empathy. Rosa as a general rule for women and men. Definitely empathy is the future. And we talked about empathy economy and the future of work and leadership with Dr. Jackie Taylor just last year in September. So Rosa, we are heading towards the end of our show. I wanted to ask you about the book that you think would help your career if you read it sooner. 
<laughs> well, I must say that uh, I, I, I have a book in mind uh, that I, uh, I read some years ago, but I, I, I was, I, and I'm going to tell you in a, in a second, but uh, I, I think that uh, there are many things out there that can help. Uh, and, and I have been reading some of them, you know, about psychology, behaviorism, uh, even feminism as well, no? how, you know, to, to feel equal. Uh, and that has been very useful uh, uh, through my career journey. And I wish that some of these things I will have read a little bit earlier, but okay, uh, it's never late if it comes. Uh, but one book I would like to signal uh, is uh, Who Moved My Cheese? from uh, Spencer Johnson. I don't know if uh, the, some people in the audience know that book or you, Beata, but if no, not, I not fully recommend it. Okay. It's a very, you know, it's a very short and sweet book that it is about change and how you approach change. And I am firm believer that change is the only constant. I mean, and if you ask me for a quote of life, that will be my quote. And, uh, and this is what I really, you know, keep you uh, moving, keeps you uh, um, engaging with new things and, and also uh, being able to, well, to know when it's time, you know, to go out of your area of comfort, be it a change of jobs, but also be it a change of responsibilities within your job, you know, or trying to go into new fields uh, within your the same company. So uh, this is a book that, in fact, uh, tells the story of two mice that obviously they found a cheese. They are very happy, but this cheese moves on. So then they need to try to see how to approach they looking for the cheese because obviously without cheese they cannot eat and they cannot survive. And you really see two ways of approaching life. And, uh, and in fact, what, uh, what this book shows is that uh, all beliefs do not lead you to new cheese. So if you really want to get something, you really need to kind of, you know, be open and be, uh, you know, uh, 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 embracing, uh, you know, new things. And, um, and then you discover um, for yourself how to deal with the change. And in fact, the more you discover that, I think that allows you to enjoy less stress and more success in your work and in your life, because obviously it's about practicing. So I also think it's very good for the well-balance of, of, um, of the person. Olga Vasina says, fabulous book. I loved Who Moved My Cheese. Uh, great to hear, Olga, that you read it. I didn't read it, but I can think of a business, uh, well, a book idea, uh, because I know somebody who loves ice cream, and I would actually make it Who Moved <laughs> My Ice Cream, because that would be definitely motivation for this hermit to go out of her comfort zone. Marianne, greetings to you. Now, Rosa, you mentioned also uh, that contrary to all the usual paths, your career is not the result of a careful design and a rigorous execution, but many of the changes have been the result of curiosity, willingness to do new things, and making the most of the opportunities that crossed your path. That's definitely uh, following your cheese wherever it goes. Rosa, I wanted to ask you uh, our favorite question. Imagine the pandemic is over and you could have private breakfast with any person in the world, anywhere in the world. Who would you choose and where would you go to? Okay, so here I will have... Um... Uh, I have one person in mind um, that I will choose uh, Michelle Obama. Uh, I am uh, very much uh, inspired uh, by her uh, biography. I mean, not only what we know about being the former, you know, first lady of the United States, but also, you know, how she built up the career coming um, uh, from, a, from a not super wealthy family, but made it into the best universities. Then how also she approached her career. I mean, I don't know if the audience knows that, but she, in fact, she was the boss of Barack Obama at the time. Um, and, uh, and then how she also uh, adapted and uh, helped so much in the shadow, you know, to get um, uh, to get um, her husband, at, uh, you know, into the into the position. So I really think that uh, for me is a very kind of inspiring person. I think she has 
it's still a lot to show to us and uh, I would really love to have breakfast. Where about? Well, I think I will let her choose. <laughs> Probably she's busier than me. I wouldn't mind to go to the United States for that. Um, but yeah, that would be a person I very much like, uh, yeah, to at least, you know, to, to listen to uh, in, a, in a live setup. And if Michelle said, well, I'll let you choose, which place would you choose? Well, honestly, if, uh, if she lets me choose, I would probably take her to Brussels, you know, so like that I benefit from her coming here, understanding how, you know, European Union works, you know, and probably I will also be able to, you know, to, to pull a few people with me that I'm sure they will be also very happy. Uh, but yeah, I will invite her here. So is that uh, is that a correct way of thinking? You believe if it wasn't for Michelle, we wouldn't have Obama as president? Well, I maybe I wouldn't, uh, you know, be categoric about it. But what I really, really think is that without her, it will have been very different. And in fact, I also think this is reversing, you know, uh, not only, I mean, the fact is that obviously in that case, uh, it was a, 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 a man that made it, right? But I also think that always, you know, or in many cases, there is someone next to us, you know, helping, like we can also be helping others. So I really think it's about collaboration. And indeed, uh, without Michelle, probably Barack would have been different. Absolutely. It's also about finding the right people on your path. So, Rosa, we've got comment from Marianne, who said, definitely Beata will wait for whom of my ice cream book. Thank <laughs> you very much. I've got somebody signed up for my pre-publishing <laughs> version. It's excellent. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Rosa, we talked about your path, how you made it, what you believe is the right way to approach the career in finance. What is your number one advice for whoever would like to consider a career in finance, whether male or female? We are talking diversity. Yeah, true. Um, so I really think that um, what it is uh, very important is uh, to see yourself as equal, you know. And now here we are talking about, you know, the gender diversity. Uh, it is very important to think that, okay, you know, if others can do it, I could also do it. So have that kind of mindset uh, very clear in your mind. Believe in you, I think is also very important, you know, be focused, you know, and okay, think very carefully uh, on what you want and, you know, not doubt too much. And uh, the last thing I think is super important is that you need to work hard. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, maybe a few people, you know, get things uh, very easily or, you know, uh, whatever. But I really think that the, the mindset of, of, of hard working is something that it is very important if you want to do definitely a career in finance, but probably I will think that in any other field, you know. Uh, so I think it's about, you know, confidence. But balance confidence, because I think too much is not good. So balance confidence um, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and hard working capacity. Having that mindset helps. Uh, Rosa, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to also ask you about your life lesson quote. How did it change you in your career path or whether it was in piano lessons or your rehearsals? What is your favorite life lesson quote? Well, I have uh, the one I, I already mentioned uh, is that the change is the only constant. I really think that to me, this, is, this has been the most revealing one because uh, we, sometimes, you know, we think that things are forever and they are not. Um, and not only that, you know, things are, you know, changing. Uh, and in fact, our world is evolving thanks to great ideas and innovation. And this means change. So I really think that it is very important to know that, you know, uh, not only things, also people around you, teams 
are changing and it is very important to be able to adapt and to be positive about change because otherwise i mean stick staying there and in fact the book i recommend it is also linked a lot uh, into this um uh, life lesson quote you know you really need to kind of be pushed by something and i really think this is the adaptation to new things to curiosity that i hope that comes with me until the end beautiful uh, quotation to finish off our show i have another quotation we need women of all levels including the top to change the dynamic reshape the conversation to make sure women's voices are heard and heeded not overlooked and ignored that's sherry sandberg speaking to us uh, rosa thank you so much for joining our show I would like to invite everyone to join our next week guest. Nikki Stewart is going to talk about how to find digital freedom, whether it's working in finance, whether it's uh, working digitally or non-digitally. There is definitely a way to find your digital freedom, even if you're doing handwork. You can be on Etsy and many other platforms. We're going to talk about it next week. Rosa, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Tell people and they may forget, allow, show them, they may remember, but involve them and they will understand. That's definitely the way that Rosa uh, got her hands dirty and made sure that her hard work paid off. When you focus on positives, the positives get more positive. If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. We were talking about change. We were talking about growing by experiencing, seeing yourself as equal and having that mindset of you can do it. Thank you, everyone, especially those who were part of the show and made comments. Agatha Bellon, IPOV, Patrick Young, Jamil Navarroza, Aspirant, In Love and In Pain, Marianne Madera and Olga Vasina. This is your day to hack the future, hack the positivity you want in European Union, in Feze, wherever in the world you are. Thank you. See you next week.